Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and warm welcome to the launch of European Tech Insights 2020. My name is Oskar Jonsson. I am the academic director of the Center for the Governance of Change. Um, some of you might know me and some of you might not. This is my first um, event I'm doing here. The European Tech Insights is a report where we are trying to investigate the attitudes towards the technological future of among Europeans, Americans and Chinese. Um, today we are very happy to welcome Diego de la Casa, who is the executive vice president at IE and he's also the co-chair of the Center for the Governance of Change. So I will very happy to invite Diego to uh, give the uh, welcoming remarks and explain a little bit the thinking behind the report. Please, Diego, the floor is yours. D Diego, I think you're on mute still. Yep, okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Oscar. Uh, welcome to uh, everybody uh, to this new European Tech Insights uh, 2020. First thing I want to do is to thank in advance to all of the attendees uh, in this virtual summit this year for this uh, special circumstances. Uh, also thanks to the panelists and to the members of the Center for the Governance of Change for such an amazing work. Given the COVID-19 situation, we have been able to include data of the impact of this huge disruption, making the survey of maximum interest. As you all know, technology is transforming the world around us and brings a combination of excitement and opportunity, but also challenges uh, to, to, makes challenges to our way of life, labor and how we save what, what is ours. While we benefit from uh, some of the opportunities, opportunities it uh, creates, from increasing general prosperity to improving our quality of life and healthcare, it also brings undeniable disruption to much of what we hold uh, dear. Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the most significant events in decades that will shape the decade to come. However, there is no simple picture of the pandemic on how the pandemic will impact. Rather, technological change will hyperpower it in certain sectors, healthcare and the digital transformation of work and pleasure, whilst uh, other processes are halting, such as uh, global trade, supply chain, movement of people and energy markets. We are facing the greatest economic crisis since the Great Recession, but the scenario is different today. Automation is changing the dynamics of the labor market. And today's companies run more on data and algorithms than physical labor. This places fundamentally different requirements for education as well, something that we have taken to our mission at IE. Technological change has always reshaped the world, but this time the speed of change is quicker than ever. This change does not happen by itself to outcomes beyond human agency. Rather, the ideas of what we want to use techn technology for is shaping its development. To know what citizens are hopeful and fearful about, uh, it needs to, to, um, to, to have a crafting of a strategy of technological change. The political upheavals that we have uh, seen around the world have been characterized by an, uh, an inability to foresee change and maintain legitimacy among its citizens as common themes. For, from the very beginning, we saw that it was a sense essential that the Center for the Governance of Change uh, build that knowledge base, and therefore we launched the European Tech Insights. We do this alongside the aid research programs and many other initiatives at the intersection of technological change and governance on topics from the future of healthcare, 
data integrity, AI strategies, as well as, uh, as the future of education. For this reason, I'm very happy to open this uh, discussion with leading experts and dig deeper into the key findings of the report. Now, Oscar, I'm going to, to, um, to lead you um, to, to, um, to leave you so, so you can lead us in the rest of the event. Thank you very much to everybody for, for attending, and I hope you find this in, uh, report interesting. Thank you very much for those kind words, Diego. Uh, we will proceed a little bit as following. Um, first, I will outline the key findings uh, of the report um, for you all to hear quite briefly. Then we will launch into a, um, a, um, a panel discussion with our panel. And with us, we have some of the, so sorry for that. We have some of the leading figures in themes of automation, um, how to regulate big tech and data privacy. We have Carl B. Frey, who is director of the Future Work Program at the Oxford Martin School, author of the new book, um, The Technology Trap. We also have um, Marietje Schake, who is the international policy director um, from the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford University. She has been an MEP for 10 years and is um, perhaps most known as uh, dubbed by Politico as the ultimate digital member of, member of European Parliament. And we also have uh, with us Carlos Lastra, who is assistant professor at IE, who is one of the main authors of the report, and he is research coordinator at the Center for the Governance of Change. Um, and also research director for a program together with IBM on the future of skills and education. So to mention a little bit about the report, um, we have almost 3,000 respondents, 2,883 in 11 different countries. And as Diego mentioned, we first ran the report in January before the pandemic, but then we did a rerun in a select number of countries, those at the time hardest hit countries um, Italy, Spain, China, and the US. So for those four countries, we can see how attitudes to technological change uh, has changed with the pandemic. I will briefly uh, outline the, the, the key findings of the report. Um, please write your questions in the chat. Uh, I think that's the easiest way to, to see it rather than the Q&A function. And we will pick them up in the discussion um, with, the, with the panel later. So the first thing we found is that the COVID-19 is decreasing concerns about privacy. We saw clear uh, support for Chinese style tracking system in Italy with 79% and Spain in 67%. This we found quite notable as it entails a quite a significant degree of restriction of freedom of movement, but also surveillance of, of personal um, personal information. Another finding is how the pandemic made citizens more willing to reduce their privacy, either for growth or either for security. Here to the right, you see in the red, you see the finding after the COVID-19. And to the left, you see the European average split between I would reduce uh, my privacy or increase surveillance for the risk of terror attack. I would do it for jobs. I would do it for either. Um, and you see the combined there, uh, there's a lot of support for, for making restrictions on privacy. The second theme is we saw that the COVID-19 pandemic was touching upon attitudes to automation. And that included, first of all, we saw that support for limit, limiting automation doubled in China and increased by over 30% in Spain after the pandemic. We asked respondents of, um, are they willing to limit automation in, by law uh, to protect jobs? And in the findings on limiting automation, we also found a notable generational divide, and that is by those citizens under 55, there was a majority in favor of limiting automation, probably the most 
exposed to um, to that, whereas the older ones were, were not in favor, they were against banning automation. But then we asked, do you think that a robot will be able to do your job better than you within the next 10 years? And here you can see Netherlands and Spain are quite representative for the European average, where around 60% were saying, um, no, I don't think my job can be done within the coming 10 years um, by a robot. UK is the outlier who has the most, um, I, I don't know if I would call it optimistic, but they have the highest confidence in their own capabilities. 70% is saying, no, a robot cannot do my job. Whereas in China, 64% believe that, um, yes, a robot will be able to do my job within 10 years. We'll get back a little bit more on the cultural divide here in uh, attitudes to technology. Here we can see on attitudes towards big tech companies, we saw a very interesting difference between the US and China, where most of the big tech companies are located, and Europe, who has a, a stated problem with the lack of big technology companies. Spain and Italy, there was a majority support for um, taxing big tech companies to pay more to finance the economic recovery after COVID. Um, whereas in the US and China, they said, no, all companies should, should share the burden or that there shouldn't be any more taxes to handle the, the economic fallout. And in general, um, Europeans were more willing to regulate, limit, de-escalate tech than uh, the Chinese in the US. Here's another example. When you ask directly, would you support limiting or de-escalating big tech? And 31% of Europeans were in favor um, of limiting big tech and de-escalating them. As you can see, China here is a notable outlier with 71% um, who's will, who are prioritizing um, supporting their growth. And here in the bottom left corner, you can see Germany as a notable outlier with the only uh, states where you're saying limit and de-escalate big tech companies were in the majority with 41%. It can also be mentioned here that 45% of Europeans see uh, companies such as Uber or Deliveroo as ethically regrettable. And the figures were much lower in, in China and the UK. Moreover, we asked about the current trade war between China and the US. And there we found a quite strong support uh, among the US population. 40% thought it was a good strategy that the US should keep putting tariffs uh, to defend their economy, putting tariffs on China specifically. And perhaps surprisingly, European citizens were agreeing 41% were in support of um, US style tariffs on China to protect our economy. And lastly, we surveyed Europeans about their attitudes to having digital avatars that had access to citizens' data. And based on that data, we generate a profile representing their interest. And the question was, are you excited about the idea of having an algorithm with access to data instead of a, uh, instead of a politician? And among young Europeans, that was 37% who was excited about the idea of um, digital avatars instead of politicians. When it came to those over 55, 81% um, were worried and it was a very little support. To find out more and get the report, it is now available um, all the way at cgc.ie.edu. Um, and I will stop my screen share then and try to get the panel up here so you can see them. Uh, can I ask Carl and Carlos to uh, put your video on? There we have Carl, who I introduced just before. Um, I'm also going to say, don't miss Carl's book, The Technology Trap, which dives deep into these questions. Um, and I will start by asking the first question to um, 
to you, Carl. Um, what are your first impressions while, while reading the report? I think you're on mute, Carl. But, but the okay, there we go. Right, now, okay. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again, please? Sorry, and I was asking your first impression why, why watching these figures, and in particular on automation. It's an extraordinarily interesting report on an extraordinarily important and timely topic. And what I found particularly striking to see was the change in sentiment in China, a doubling in the share of respondents saying that they favor limits on the number of machines that businesses are allowed to implement. And that is on a backdrop of an economy that has expanded enormously in large part due to manufacturing and the adoption of robots in recent years. And um, which uh, leads me to think that we are living through really extraordinary times. And I think it rhymes very well with what we've seen in the past, which is that during recessions and economic downturns, sentiment towards automation tend to become more sour. We saw during the Great Depression that the Roosevelt administration tried to block the introduction of machinery in certain industries to preserve jobs. We saw during the first industrial revolution, Luddites rioting against the mechanized factory. And they did so particularly during the years of the continental blockade when the British economy uh, suffered quite severely from trade disruption as Napoleon blocked various ports during the Napoleonic War. And, and in similar fashion, we've seen automation anxiety during the three post-Korean War recessions in the 50s and 60s. We've seen it again come back as a consequence of the Great Recession. And now we're seeing it even um, in China. So I think it rhymes very well with the pattern and the intuition that if people have see worsening outside options, if people have poor job alternatives, then automation is obviously a lot worse than losing your job to machinery in a booming labor market where you have a lot of other options. So I find that finding particularly interesting. Yeah, on that note, you, you wrote in your book that um, if you were born in the 40s, 90% uh, would have it better than their parents, whereas if you were born in the 80s, such as myself, uh, only 50% would have it better than their parents. And uh, this is explained as a sort of a backdrop to, to, techn to technological change. And I think you also make a good point of saying that um, you know, no one was against the telescope because it didn't uh, substitute any labor. And if you add a crisis pandemic lens on that, do you see, um, I mean, the longer term trends, does it point that we, we will see a skyrocketing of resistance to technological change now? Are we seeing a great repeat yeah, I mean, it should be said, first of all, that the Shetty statistic um, that you just cited uh, comes from the United States. And obviously these have, trends have played out somewhat differently in different countries, depending on institutions, depending on welfare systems, and depending on the bargaining power of labor unions, depending on how much lobbying power businesses have. So uh, it must be said that automation, like every other variable, interacts with different institutions in different countries. But I do think that you see quite broadly that the labor share of income has fallen, that wages of the unskilled have come under pressure. And I think there is a sense, uh, particularly among the unskilled, that uh, the possibilities of moving up the income ladder has become uh, much harder. And, and I think that what we're seeing now with this crisis only exacerbates that sentiment. And we are seeing these extraordinary pictures from the United States, terrifying um, this week. Obviously, that is not due to automation, but it's due to social cleavages that mm. have um, increased also in part due to trade and globalization. Mm. Yeah, and a little follow up on that. I think um, today calling someone a Luddite is often used very derog derogatorily. Um, but you also point to the fact that it, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, for the 
three generation coming after that, they actually got it a lot worse. So it's quite a natural reaction in terms of actually decreasing uh, living circumstances. We, have we lost that, that perspective when we're talking technological innovation today that you know, maybe in the long run it will be better, but, uh, and are we at the cusp of such a radical transformation just now? It's a very good question. I think it's important to remember that when we speak about averages, uh, it means by definition that uh, you know, we overgloss a lot of the variation, right? And if you put one hand in the freezer and the other on the stove, you should be feeling quite comfortable on average. But we know from experience that that is not the case. And the same can be said about the labor market. Before the crisis, the US labor market was doing extraordinarily well. Uh, um, unemployment figures were low. We saw to some extent the fall we see in labor force participation uh, come back. But we still see persistent rates of unemployment in certain regions, particularly in the Rust Belt, uh, that um, has seen accelerating adoption of robots. Um, and also below the belt, uh, as David Auto likes to put out, China hit um, the United States under the belt, which is the Rust Belt, um, uh, because it's in the American South where jobs have participated uh, particularly rapidly due to Chinese import competition. So those two forces have played an enormous role in reshaping the US labor market. It's played a very significant role in Europe as well. A recent study that come out from researchers at the University of Bocconi shows that populism is more widespread in electoral districts and regions where jobs have disappeared due to automation. Uh, so I do think that there is a parallel and, and as you pointed out, yes, the Luddites were not the ones who saw uh, the benefits from technological change, so the opposition made sense. Uh, that is not to suggest that the Industrial Revolution was a bad thing uh, over the long run. Uh, it's been enormously beneficial uh, to all of us, and we can be grateful that the Luddites didn't have it their way. But I think at the same time, we also need to recognize that uh, automation comes with what the great uh, economist Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction in employment. Um, and that is uh, at times a painful process. And it's particularly painful if you're in the midst of a recession or even a depression, which this arguably is. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I want to bring Carlos in. Carlos, first, first you had a comment, but then also please go on and uh, give us your impressions of the report. What, what struck you the most? I mean, as I said, you're one of the main authors of the report. Uh, Okay, thanks, um, Oscar. Yeah, first I just um, like to echo uh, some of what Carl was saying, which I think is very on point. And um, uh, Luddism is really the right term, right? Like, so something we found last time that is uh, replicated th last time last year in this survey, and this time is that uh, much more so than it's in the policy debate. Um, Europeans seem to be in favor, Europeans, but not Chinese, interestingly, um, are very, uh, seem, to, uh, seem to be very keen on taking really some quite extraordinary measures um, in terms of limiting automation, such as banning it outright. Last year, we had questions um, about introducing um, additional taxes, um, accounting of whether there would be a one-for-one -one substitution for workers. And for all of those, uh, about three quarters of the uh, respondents were in favor of, of uh, um, such really extraordinary measures that people don't talk about. Um, and yet the flip side is that um, there's very little that, um, that uh, Europeans see in favor of uh, automation. So this time we included a question on uh, the kind of classic uh, John Maynard Keynes story of, uh, well, maybe one day we'll be able to have uh, shorter weeks, uh, work weeks uh, with, uh, in exchange for uh, robots doing some of our work. Uh, and uh, and that, that was, you know, just one, um, we included it as one um, potential example of the upside that at the very personal level Europeans may see. And Europeans were, you know, uh, respondents were really not having it, right? Like they don't believe anything like that will happen. Again, interestingly, the Chinese, I think, 
um, uh, up to 71% of the Chinese see the probability of that happening as high or uh, very high. Uh, so, you know, a remarkable kind of uh, uh, interest in stopping automation and really no upside uh, that Europeans perceive of it. No. First of all, just let me say uh, to, to all the attendees, we're having, Mariette is having some problems joining. She's still struggling, try to try to get in. So we're working on that. She's still coming. Uh, I want to ask in particular, Carlos, you know, one of the main highlights was that um, citizens' concern of, of privacy dropped quite notably. Um, do you consider this, do you see this as a temporary change because now a crisis is so near felt that it's like, okay, no, I'm gonna, gonna throw all my location data out the window. Uh, or do you see this as permanent that for instance, well, okay, actually it has a function to, to give away this data privacy and I shouldn't worry that much about it. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question and a remarkable um, finding, uh, as you said, is that um, the really quite high uh, concern depends of, on how it's phrased a little bit, and we include different questions, but depending how, how we phrase the question, whether it's about um, the ownership of the data or um, uh, the, on which uh, Europeans were always very assertive that uh, uh, data is ours, more so the older generations, but um, so 81% of, of the European population said that uh, were assertive uh, uh, that data should be treated as proprietary on their own. And, um, and you know, also they uh, expected some um, income uh, in return for exchanging it. Um, but, uh, so we didn't ask uh, that particular question. Um, again, after the, uh, after the the pandemic hit, but we did ask the basically the the um, rate at which um, Europeans respondents were a, were willing to give up their privacy in exchange for good things that may come up come out of the data sharing. And back then in January, we didn't think about health as much. So we talked about uh, exchanging. Um, uh, your data in, in exchange for uh, more jobs for the economy, so benefiting the economy, the idea that uh, this would enable the growth of certain sectors, or enhancing public safety, such as through uh, terrorist surveillance or whatever. We left it vague like that. Um, and um, uh, the share that was just over half the, of Europeans that were willing to give up, up data on that way kind of dropped uh, or increased, sorry, uh, pretty precipitous, precipitously, right? Like so pretty fast uh, or pretty steeply uh, up to 15% uh, in Italy, which was one of the uh, hardest hit countries. And as to your question, um, uh, so, so the, um, the concerns about data are there. So data privacy seems to be this abstract uh, uh, concern that we have, but um, we wish it seems to be uh, something that is very easily, uh, that, that is uh, very easily conceded. So uh, already when you start talking about um, uh, kind of uh, how more data may help to grow the economy, um, not even your personal situation, but the economy, or to enhance public safety, people seem less concerned about the privacy of their own data. And now that the uh, pandemic has hit, and there's obviously the suggestion that uh, a more intense use of data, uh, such as the so-called uh, uh, track and tracing, um, uh, it may be, may be very useful in combating this pandemic, uh, things look very different. As to whether this is a permanent change of, or, uh, or uh, sort of uh, what, like a dip in that concern, um, it's hard to say, right? Uh, as we always say, well, it depends what really happens with the pandemic, but this seems, so the, in my, my take is, as I've been suggesting that the, concern about data privacy is very abstract and very remote and kind of something for like dessert 
kind of optional and particularly optional for the young people, whereas as, as soon as things get serious is basically the first thing that goes away. So I I, I'd be surprised that uh, if we, that um, we'll be very concerned uh, that the public will be very concerned over the last, over the next few years about, about uh, data privacy. Yeah, I think I think I think it's it's there's there's a couple of oxymorons in the report, and one of them is asking uh, respondents how concerned are you about data privacy, and everybody says we're we're very very concerned, and then you ask them, are you willing to have worse services or pay for it, and then people say no. Um, I think the other such oxymoron is also the on the trade war when you ask respondents, um, you know, is it important? Well, also you know, raising tariffs, but also furthering. Um, you know, European technological development. And then you ask people, do you choose to buy European or not? But then, and then people are saying, no, I, I choose the best and cheapest product. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't buy European for that matter. Uh, I wanted to loop back a little bit to, to, the, to you, Carl. Um, you were an author, a co-author of a, of a very influential report, uh, which, you know, some would call the 47% report. You said 47% of jobs in the U.S. Were, were very likely to be automated. And that finding was really caught fire across the world. It was, I think, probably seven years ago. And if you take that uh, report's insight and put it in a comparison to our question when we asked, do you think a robot will be able to do a job within 10 years? Europeans were actually very, very confident in saying, I think it was something around 63% or something saying that, um, no, a robot would not be able to do my job. And in, in, in the UK where you live, they, it was 70% uh, who said, no, a robot will not be able to do my job. Um, what do you think? Are they, are they optimistic? Are they pessimistic? Um, that, you know, if you can flip it and say 30% of, of Brits think that they will, a robot will do, the, do their job in 10 years. What, what's your take, Carl? Wait, you're still on mute. There we go. Okay, so I think broadly speaking, what you find in the report uh, mirrors some of our estimates. So we do find that people in low skill jobs are more exposed to automation. And, and people that are younger as well tend to work in those low skilled jobs and they seem to be more concerned. Uh, if 60% don't think that their job can be automated, it all still means that they're quite a significant share thinks uh, it can be. So it's not that far of our estimates, but broadly speaking, I do think that you're right that people to some extent underestimate the potential scope of automation. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that the job will be automated the way though, which we discuss at some length um, in the article and in the book as well, right? Because a lot of factors drive decisions to automate. Even if Google Translate becomes perfect tomorrow, unless we certify Google Translate, it's not going to replace translators in large numbers. The same is true for bus drivers, unless we give uh, autonomous vehicles, a driver's license, those jobs are not going to go in large numbers either. So I think that people also tend to factor some of those uh, concerns in when they ask, uh, answer these questions and don't necessarily just think about the technological capabilities, which is what we focus on uh, in the paper. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a fascinating insight in itself that, that people's self-estimations and your calculations are, are, are landing somewhat similarly. Um, Carlos, you're, we haven't fully kicked off the project yet, but you are uh, leading a project on, on the future work and skills where we're looking at basically the demand side of the labor market and trying to match that with the supply side and we'll, uh, we'll probably reach some very, very interesting mismatches. What's your take on um, the job substitution question? And you are muted. Yes, so um, yeah, you're right. So we're going to be looking precisely at this question in one of the upcoming projects that, um, that uh, will be coming out of the uh, collaboration with um, of the Center for the Governance of Change and IBM, or basically the supply side or what uh, higher education institutions, both kind of academic institutions and more vocational institutions in the Euro Europe and in the US, 
uh, produce and how that uh, meets the demands of the um, labor market. Um, um, so stay tuned on that. Um, one of the uh, most interesting things to come out of the report on your question or the more so the paradoxical things to come out of the report, um, I'd love to hear um, Carl's comment on is, um, so uh, the young seem to be a lot more concerned about their own job being substituted away. And so it's, it's just a question that we have, so we don't know, yeah, we'd love in uh, future years to follow up as to the mechanisms what people with the young and the old are thinking right so uh, the young seem to think that their own job uh, can be uh, more easily substitutable um, which is perhaps surprising right like as you you think that they're doing uh, that you know a lot of substitutions already going on so whatever jobs they're coming into are more uh, technical higher order etc right at the same time uh, you know, maybe the old thing, well, you know, nobody, like, a job is safe for another 10 years or so, and it's just uh, after that, that jobs like mine will be substituted. Um, and it may also have to do with uh, the sort of, um, a more, more tragically, right, the sort of LIFO approach that uh, is prevalent in several of the European uh, countries in our sample. So the young even if their skills are less substitutable, they're kind of the first to go. Um, in in uh, a recession, their jobs are less secure, they're outsiders to the economy. Uh, so that's kind of one of the, that sort of funny U-shape of the young being actually the, the ones that are most worried about their own jobs sub being substituted is one of the um, interesting findings that we have on on uh, automation here. Yeah. Did you have a comment on that, Carl? You mute, muted. There we yeah, go. I think uh, many of the young that you will have surveyed enter the labor market in the post Great Recession era. Um, and I think they've entered a particularly bad labor market uh, in many places. Huge uh, figures of youth unemployment in Europe, uh, also uh, in parts of the United States. So I think that is something that plays into this. I think another question is that sentiment tends to change as people go older. So if you look at taxes, for example, the young are always more positive on taxes until they get a job and actually are affected by them. And, and it may be the same uh, with automation to some extent. So those are two possible explanations, uh, but clearly it's something that uh, would be of interest to look into further. Yeah. Another question for you, Carl. Um, not only as, uh, as working at a, at a British university, but also as a European, one of the things I really can't get my head around when looking at this report uh, and seeing the latest strategy papers from the European Commission, for instance, they're saying Europe is now going to be a global digital player. We're going to regain our technological sovereignty, which we you know, saw in the contact tracing app history that there were, you know, European governments were completely unable to, to establish their own contact tracing apps, but had to rely on Google Apple. So I, I see a contradiction here. On the one hand, the, it feels like the EU is dying for big tech companies. On the other hand, um, Europeans seems a lot more willing to tax them, to regulate them, to break them up. Um, and is, is this a case of, you know, wanting to have the cake and eat it not, or eat, and eat it too? Because if we had the right mix, then, you know, e, EU countries would be full of big tech, but we don't have big tech. Um, and is this, this you know, do you, have you, and I mean, you, you're looking at the future of work and it seems like a lot of the pioneering technologies will be uh, within being pioneered by big tech. So uh, can the EU have the cake and eat it too, or do, does it need to choose between um, big tech giants roaming free? Um, what, what's your take on this? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think obviously the Europeans not having any of the large tech companies means that they are more eager to tax and regulate them 
than the Chinese or the Americans are. And I think that's only natural. And I think one reason that, you know, global regulation works fairly well in finance, for example, is that every country has banks and everybody has an interest in those uh, being uh, relatively stable. Uh, the asymmetries when it comes to tech companies means that different places have to take very different stances and attitudes um, on them. Um, I think it's hard to make a case, though, that European regulation and antitrust will be the reason for Europe not having any uh, of these large tech companies, uh, because at least I can't recall a single case where Europe had a big tech company on the rise and it was broken up. So I don't think that is the key explanation. I think it's a combination of different regulatory regimes across European countries uh, and the fact that cultural barriers and language and, and all of these things play a much bigger role when it comes to uh, trade and export um, of services. Um, and the English language has you know, benefited the United States hugely. Um, the fact that it has a harmonized, uh, sort of culturally and relatively uh, hom uh, homogenous uh, population um, helps um, as well. So um, I do think that those are more the inherent advantages of the United States. Also the close c connection between industry and the universities being extremely well funded, uh, a thriving venture capital um, industry going back to the 50s. I think these are things that are working in the favor um, of the US. I don't think it's uh, uh, the case that Europe has sort of uh, let down or, or, or over-regulated big tech and that's the reason why we don't have it here. And I think it's because of those factors I just mentioned. Mm. Carlos, um, your take and also the report's take, please. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on one thing that I thought was interesting about this particular finding, uh, which is the big divide. So we call it on um, most of the countries, as um, they're all for you to see, uh, the European countries. But as a reference, we included uh, the US, China, uh, Mexico. Um, and of the countries we include, um, it's interesting that the big divide seems to be in the, on this question, right? Uh, on the level of support for these GAFA, so these large tech companies, the big divide seems to be between the US and Europe on the one hand, and then Mexico and China on the other hand. So a remarkable 78% uh, um, of Mexicans, 71% of Chinese, uh, basically think that the most important thing is support the growth of these large tech companies. Um, so I think that can give us pause on uh, maybe it's a, it's a kind of derivative of the, uh, I mean, there may be very different explanations of this, but the reality is that that's one place where there's a big divide between, if you wish, kind of the trade-off between growth uh, or something like one way of looking at it is the pla the place where uh, Europeans place themselves, uh, Europeans and Americans place themselves in the trade-offs between growth and the welfare state is very different from uh, where uh, the Chinese, the Mexicans, and um, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, um, uh, uh, some way behind them, but um, also in our sample, the Poles and the Estonians put themselves, right? Like they, they very much favor uh, having companies, uh, large tech companies as engines of growth compared to sort of more Western uh, European countries uh, and the United States, which is very much in line with these other uh, European countries, Spain, Italy, France, Germany, or the UK. Yeah, and I, I think I can just add some figures as well um, on the problem. I mean, if, if you ask Europeans, they're quite, uh, they're quite focused on the, re the regulation part of it. But if you ask Chinese, 24% of Chinese say, well, Europeans are simply not as entrepreneurial. Um, and 18% of Chinese says they don't have any talent. So it's a bit, uh, they're a bit unimpressed in China. You can hear about this. So I have a question from, from Joe Haslam who asks, um, so-called D10 Club of Democratic Partners are 
thinking of to create alternative suppliers of 5G equipment to avoid relying on China. I don't know if any of you guys have dug into this, but I will pose the question anyway. Um, do you think it will happen or, and should it happen? Well, I think it will happen. Uh, whether it should happen very much depends on how China evolves, and I think that's a separate question uh, by itself. Um, I think there's really no alternative. The United States is not going to go for uh, who buys 5G. Um, it's going to, uh, well, definitely want its allies and the places where it provides its intelligence services and has intelligence collaborations with not to have invested or adopted uh, Chinese 5G. So I do think that uh, it's something that is going to happen. Whether that is a good thing or not uh, is a separate question and very much depends, as I said, on the direction in which China is going, which I personally find uh, somewhat worrying uh, uh, at time, for the time being. Yeah, no, I think I, yeah, I'll just jump in a little bit because I've, I've, I've done a couple of things with it. And I mean, if you take the slogan view of what 5G is, uh, the backbone of tomorrow's economy, um, do you think you would want to have critical vulnerabilities for a, um, a company that has been known to uh, spy for the state of China, as in the case with the African Union in Ethiopia, or as a state where you have political disagreements that lead to standoffs? Um, would you want your most critical infrastructure uh, to be Chinese in those cases. So my guess would be it will both happen and both that it should happen. Um, Carlos, we had a question as well on uh, politics and AI in comparison with last year's finding uh, when you had, for instance, a 43% support in the Netherlands uh, on a similar question of substituting um, politicians with, with the algorithms. Uh, so Carlos, please go on. Um, yeah, uh, Alpen's uh, questions, I think it's very, um, very on point. So we did actually build on that question that we had last year, uh, the global media attention about the willingness to substitute uh, the, as we framed it last year, the one place where Europeans were excited about automation was in uh, politics. Right, um, the, they were ready to automate away the politicians. They didn't like any other robots, but they liked to use robots rather than politicians. So we made it a little more specific on the finding, and you have it on the finding four um, on um, on the use of digital avatars, right? Uh, where we uh, where we provide a kind of more detail. Uh, explanation or what they would do. Um, there's been experiments um, about how this would work, right? Um, or thought extents and otherwise, right? Uh, of uh, basically the idea or like a starting point of some of the thinking here is that uh, um, politicians are asked to do too much today and they don't, they're humans, so they don't have the capacity to do what machine learning and AI are very good at doing, which is processing information. So, um, so uh, digital avatars would be, uh, as politicians, uh, would be able to, um, to, would be able to both process um, information about kind of optimal policies under some set of conditions, right? Like they'd be able to process the impact um, of what will happen. So we have now all these sudden debates that have come afresh about the levels of minimum wage, the levels of um, uh, universal basic income, things like this that we really don't know, like even economists in years doing uh, research on this, uh, they either do it in a very kind of specific context or they, uh, or they get kind of very caveated results. The information is really very limited and the information that we're able to process is limited. Whereas for all purposes, the information that these digital avatars would have would be infinite or would be unlimited. And also they would be able to process this kind of general information about the true effect that, that policies may have, which 
right now involves a lot of guesswork on the part of politicians. And at the same time, they'd be able to much better aggregate the preferences um, of uh, their constituents, of the uh, people they represent. And once again, uh, we do find that um, the Europeans are reasonably excited about this. So about a quarter of Europeans are excited about the possibility of using digital avatars. Um, and if you add to those, those who are only somewhat worried, that gives you another third. So in total, uh, over half. So if you assume that those who are somewhat worried uh, have worries that can be kind of tackled easily. And this is once again a question where there's kind of a big uh, generational divide, right? So uh, those who, uh, oh, the over 55s are very worried about, about um, uh, the, this possibility, while uh, this goes down to only 27% for the um, below 35. So, uh, so this is going to be something that, uh, that will say more about, I'm sure, in the future and that we'll want to pursue uh, because it's, as I said, one of, these, uh, one of the only realms where Europeans seem to be uh, evidently excited about tech. Okay, we got um, two final questions, which I think we can wrap up and put together because they are of such the nature that I will reinterpret them and make them to a coherent question. So you will be able to answer both the two questions at once. And uh, the first question is, do we think that the EU Commission's plan for digitalization is well designed to address the technology gap between Europe, the US and China? Uh, let's call it the, the lack of big tech in, in Europe and the lack of contribution to the technological arms race, as some would even use a stronger term. And the second question is, how would you describe the perception governments globally have of current technological trends? Basically, how well is the EU level uh, planning and thinking suited to deal with the, with the lack? And how does national governments um, think about the, cur the current technological trends? Um, I'll give the floor over to you, Carl, to start with. It's an easy question. Um, well, I think, to be honest, uh, many of the factors that we discussed earlier, uh, such as language barriers and cultural barriers, are uh, more important than the infrastructure that has already been rolled out to some extent. And I mean, I do think obviously that there is investment going to be needed in digital skills, in digital infrastructure, in all of these things. And obviously harmonization and efforts of the commission is going to play a substantial role as well. But I think that most innovation tends to happen in clusters. Many of those innovations that have taken place in Silicon Valley uh, were sort of spontaneous interaction between individuals, entrepreneurs, innovators. I think it's by supplying much of that local infrastructure that you know creates these clusters that is going to drive innovation. Um, and I think you know replicating those is notoriously hard. It's very hard to say why you know Silicon Valley became such a huge success. Yes, the US government played some role. They had a lot of military contracts. But so did uh, Los Angeles and Seattle. And in the end um, of the day, um, Seattle didn't take off before Microsoft moved there, which is entirely separate story. And, and Los Angeles is uh, still not the tech hub uh, that uh, Silicon Valley is. So I think it has a lot to do with the ability to attract talent, the uh, framework for people to move between companies and so not having non-compete clauses, for example, was hugely important in the history of Silicon Valley. And, and I think that the ability of the European Commission to sort of create these clusters is unfortunately going to be limited. I think the best thing that can be done is a harmonization of regulation across uh, countries and, and, you know, trying to boost the venture capital industry uh, in Europe is going to be hugely important um, as well. Um, I'm less convinced about the policies of AI, which uh, many of them seems to me to be so restrictive as to suggest that we don't want to have uh, AI companies in Europe. Uh, but I think that's a separate conversation. Mm. 
Carlos, 90 seconds, your take. All right, well, I'll say something about this. Um, uh, one thing that may be anathema and something for people uh, to think about um, is that uh, maybe the European Union is kind of fundamentally not the right place for these types of policies, because as Carl said, um, uh, this is about uh, kind of you, very much a competitive race about, about between uh, places that are um, that have to uh, essentially out compete each other and attract talent from each other, and those uh, then the, those are path dependent and and eventually have huge economies of scale. So the European Union is not pro is probably not going to be able to ever say, well, we're going to decide that you know Barcelona or you know Lyon is going to be uh, the tech cluster of Europe, and it probably wouldn't be right for them to do that. Uh, so, you know, I would question the premise that the European Union is a right venue for these types of conversation. So that's one uh, controversial uh, statement. And I don't know if you want me to take the second question about the, the if we have time for that. You got 50 um, seconds. Yeah, so I just wanted, in the context of our survey, right, um, I would say in terms of how well governments um, uh, have uh, deal with technological trends. I, I, I would point to two disconnects that we find. So the first is the one that I've already mentioned. So how uh, the people, the public is much more against automation and is uh, ready to take much more radical measures than the uh, governments have been able to take. So they, they really willing to be in Carl's phrase, they really willing uh, to be Luddites and maybe they're not smashing uh, you know, Facebook and Google uh, yet, but they're definitely willing to, uh, the, the three quarters of them seem willing to stop them from uh, operating um, or to ban them, um, if you ask them in those terms. Uh, that's a question we had last time. And the second one is on the privacy issue, something that's come up. Well, only two years ago, um, uh, there was a furore and, and then a lawsuit when uh, a a portion of the United Kingdom's National Health Service uh, entered into an agreement with Google to use uh, data for really a quite a narrow uh, uh, space. They were going to use uh, patient data for uh, for creating alerts for doctors uh, to see um, if their patients were at a kind of grave and immediate risk of death. Uh, the so, uh, the Kind of DeepMind, uh, now a subsidiary of Google, uh, was using mining patient data for that purpose. So that caused a furore. Uh, the, uh, then there was a lawsuit. That process was then cancelled. So uh, that's another remarkable kind of disconnect between how governments and the public think about, um, about uh, tech. So in this case, the use of the world's acceptable use of data. Yeah, Oscar, of course. No, I think I think I think governments on a on a on an end note. I think uh, governments have a geographical problem, and that is that political representation is still defined on the same geographical term as they always been, no matter where economic activity moves. Whereas innovation is, tends to cluster in innovation hubs that are. Uh, at the same place geographically. So you have to match, uh, you have to balance those two extremes um, at the same time, which is a bit tricky for governments. Uh, first of all, we just uh, excuse so much for, for Marietje not being able to join due to technical technological problems. And it just reminds me of the old saying that I believe in uh, artificial general intelligence when I, when I see a lecturer being able to use PowerPoint. Uh, maybe that is uh, using Zoom in these pandemic times. But anyways, uh, I think we give a, a, a big virtual applause to bo both our panelists, uh, Carl and Carlos, as well as Diego, and to you, all of the attendees. The report is now available uh, online at cdc.ie.edu. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you and goodbye, everybody. Thank you.